we're coming up to the end of Malachi, although um, as we skim over the top of, hit the highlights of three of the last three, uh, last two chapters, numbers three and four, um, we're not going to go through it, obviously, in a verse-by-verse -verse pattern, but we're just going to skim over it. Um, we were talking with Dave this morning before church started here, and you know, one of the most fulfilling and at the same time disconcerting aspects of teaching from God's Word is the sheer adventure of it. When you start on a journey of studying, meditating on, and praying over a text, the path can lead to vistas and horizons that were never before seen or even anticipated. And this is true even for familiar and well-known passages where we think we've already understood it all. And I guess that is evidence that God's Word is living and active. And we mortals can never plumb the depths of it. It speaks anew to every part of life and every new situation and circumstance we find ourselves in. At the end of my message from Malachi in November, I suggested that these last two chapters were filled with good news, that it was a purely gospel message. And I probably left the impression that we were finished with all the bad news, and only happy thoughts were ahead. But my studies led me to see this text from a different perspective that seems to have what I think is a special relevance for the church and for the given the conditions, economic, political, and spiritual conditions we're living in today. So this message will be far different from my original plans, and it's a sobering one, but vital one, I believe, for preparing us to be the people that God wants us to be. So even though we're not going to be going through this on a verse-by-verse -verse basis, I would like to read the entire uh, three and fourth chapter, third and fourth chapters of Malachi. And if you want to stand, I would encourage you to do that. But if if you get tired or if the little kids get upset, I I wouldn't be offended if you sat down. So, chapter three of Malachi. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years, and I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Your words, against, your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord, yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed. For those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. 
They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day I will make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we acknowledge that these are your words. These are not the words of a man who lived 2,400 years ago, but these are the words spoken by your Holy Spirit through him. And we ask, Lord, that as we look at them, as we study them, as we consider them, that you would impress them on our hearts and that you would use them to accomplish all the purposes that you have for us, that we might truly reflect Jesus to the world around us. We pray this in his name. Amen. How many of us, when we listen to the nightly news or read articles online these days, find ourselves silently or audibly reacting with the word Maranatha? The moral and spiritual decline of our culture is undeniably accelerating at a shocking pace. In just the past 25 or 26 months since the word COVID was first heard in the news, we've experienced a true sea change in America's collective convictions and conduct and it's not been for the better. In the past 15 months since the last election, that decay has only worsened exponentially, I believe. I often comment that it seems we're no longer on the slippery slope. We've gone over the precipice. We're in free fall. My reaction to much of the daily news is typically a not so tongue in cheek prayer to God, stop the world, I wanna get off. In other words, Come, Lord Jesus, rescue us from ourselves. I'm sure many, if not most, or maybe even all of you have identical thoughts. We know that this world, with its mocking and scorning of God, its pain, its heartache, and its full-grown sin leading to death, is not our home. And we long for that kingdom where righteousness reigns eternally. We pray thy kingdom come with a lot more fervor and urgency these days. It must have been like that for the faithful believers of Malachi's day, just as it has been for the remnant of believers in every age. In these last two chapters, Malachi delivers a message of hope to the faithful living in the midst of a people who have lost their way. He assures them that a messenger will come to prepare the way, and then the Lord they seek will come suddenly to his temple. This is definitely a messianic text. An affirmation of his advent is given a second time in verse 1. Behold, take notice, he is coming. That's good news for them, great news. God will fulfill his promise to redeem and restore their nation. And having the benefit of historical hindsight, we know these prophecies in verse 1 were fulfilled in Jesus' incarnation and earthly ministry, as, it, as Luke records in his first two chapters of his gospel. However, like many biblical prophecies which had a literal fulfillment in the past, but also have a second greater fulfillment in the last days, this prophecy is one whose greater fulfillment we here today also await and long for. He is coming. In a world quickly filling to the brim with darkness and evil, that's the best and greatest news for us. But there's a caveat. Malachi's message often offers a stern caution to all who look forward to his coming with happy anticipation. Verse 2 begins with that little but tire-screeching end to our thrilling joyride, the word but. He asks in verse 2, who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears 
for he is like a refiner's fire. The answer to that rhetorical question, Malachi asks, is obviously no one. No mortal can stand before a holy, omnipotent God any more than iron can remain firm and rigid in the blast furnace. Throughout scripture, whenever our Lord fully reveals his presence to human beings, they fall flat. Mortal man cannot behold the glory of God and remain standing. Remember that Paul on the road to Damascus was struck blind and fell to the ground trembling, Acts 9, verses 4 to 6. The Roman soldiers at the tomb on Easter morning became like dead men, Matthew 28, 4. This didn't happen only to unbelievers. Even the Apostle John, the disciple closest to Jesus, the one whom he loved, when beholding the glory of the Son of Man in his, in his vision, fell as dead, Revelation 1, 17. And these are just some of the New Testament examples. I believe an important lesson for us here is that the second coming will not necessarily be a moment of great rejoicing and exuberant celebration, even for believers, at least not initially. Many years ago, our community, community ministerial association sponsored an outreach program entitled Heaven's Gate and Hell's Flames. It was a series of dramatic stage vignettes performed by local volunteers. It presented the last moments of various fictional people's earthly lives. Some were believers, some were not. After dying, they would awaken in either heaven or hell, and the drama tried to depict the joy or the terror of that awakening in eternity. Most of the parts were carefully scripted, but the directors encouraged each of those playing the Christian characters to improvise and ad-lib their lines upon awakening in the presence of the Savior. Invariably, they would rise from death and run to hug Jesus, shouting how much they loved him, how happy they were, how thankful they were to be with him. Now, I have no doubt that these amateur actors and actresses were true believers, forgiven, and trusting Jesus only. But I was, however, disappointed to see such an unbiblical idea echoed again and again with no hint of the paralyzing fright that, for example, overcame the prophet Ezekiel at least four times, chapters 1, 3, 43, and 44. This was not all a voluntary action on Ezekiel's part either. Even after commanding him to stand, in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we're told that the Spirit set Ezekiel up on his feet, indicating that he couldn't do it on his own. He needed that supernatural power. The almost universal human reaction to God's sudden appearing is a knee-buckling, muscle-debilitating awe, reverence, and godly fear. It's a heart-piercing realization of our own personal sin and depravity before the absolute holiness of God, who comes as a white-hot or refining fire, as we just read. Malachi's warning is that even for us who trust him as Lord and Savior, our first response to his appearing will most likely echoes, uh, echo Isaiah's cry, Woe is me, I am undone. I submit that Jesus' second coming will likely provoke the same reaction in us that the inhabitants of Jerusalem will give. Zechariah 12, 10 to, 4 says, 10 to 14 says, They will look on me whom they have pierced and will mourn and grieve. And that is in full realization of the weight of their sin and rebellion before God. Revelation 1, verses 6 and 7 says, Every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. That's not exactly celebration. These are hard words, and we can't casually dismiss them as not applying to us who are redeemed and forgiven. Malachi is addressing the sons of Levi here, the priestly family. And it's not good expository practice to claim verse 1 as a promise made to us, but verses 2 and 3 are warnings intended only for others. Do we think we alone will stand when he appears as a refining fire? The prophet Ezekiel and the apostle John couldn't. Perhaps you've seen movies of 19th century smelteries or refineries, where ore was made into iron or steel in the days before remote operation from air-conditioned control rooms was possible. The heat there was so intense that for protection, workers stood behind huge heat shields, wearing heavy gloves and leather aprons, watching with dark glasses 
and working the crucibles with long tools through narrow slots in the heat shields. It was very dangerous work. The refining fire spoken of in verse 2 is not a cozy October campfire. It's not warm embers in the fireplace on a snowy winter evening. It's a room-sized, oxygen-fed blowtorch, which melts and burns away the waste and leaves only purified molten metal. The launderer's soap mentioned here is not a gentle-on-the-hands Dove one-quarter cleansing cream. It's not bubble bath suds to relax in. It's a caustic, industrial-strength detergent for removing deep-seated stains. These harsh, even frightening metaphors are meant to convey only one thing, cleansing and purification. And what is the goal of this cleansing, purifying process? A garment free from all dirt and stain, or pure silver, pure gold, without a trace of dross or contamination? What does this mean for us here today? Let me be blunt and honest and direct, because there's no way to say this gently or inoffensively. The more I studied and meditated on this text, the more I became convinced that this is a message for us for the church in America, for believers living in a Christ-hating, death-loving culture, who have all, to one degree or another, winked at sin, slept while evil grew strong, and fed our passions rather than our souls. The message of hope in these last two chapters of Malachi seems to be directed especially to a church undergoing cleansing and purging, most likely through persecution. The message is for those suffering for the faith as we speak, but also for those who will be experiencing persecution in the near future. And I cannot help but conclude that we who fear the Lord here today and reference his name are players on the stage of the opening act of this drama unfolding in the United States. I expect the cancel culture to readily and speedily become the crucify culture, unless a genuine repentance and revival comes to the West first. I believe Malachi's sermon is a warning that the much longed for day of the Lord will be preceded by a cleansing and purging of his church. Through history, the Lord has commonly accomplished that refining through persecution. It's admittedly difficult to reconcile the thought of real persecution with a loving and caring God, especially for us here in the West where the price of faith for Christ has, for generations, been very small. The result is a church, and I include myself, that is far too lethargic and lazy, far too distracted and amused, far too flabby and undisciplined. In heathen lands throughout history, a much different scenario is common. Followers of Jesus in places where persecution is the rule rather than the exception develop skills and abilities which enable them to far outdistance us in this race of faith that is set before us. Let me give you one brief example from a place very close to home, the Kendall County Jail. Through a jail ministry we participate in there, Bernetta and I met a man the guards called Rod. He was a former leader in the Latin Kings on the south side of Chicago. For three generations, the gang has been his family business and he was very successful at it. Two or three years ago, though, while in jail serving one sentence and awaiting trial for another, the Lord called him out of the gang experience to, repentant and, to repentance and faith in an amazing way. And I can tell you the story later some. For his own safety as an ex-gang member, he was transferred from Cook County Jail to other jails and eventually to Kendall County, where we met him. Rod's journey of faith has been beautiful but living mostly as the only committed believer within the correction system has been very hard. He receives constant scorn and much ill treatment from all the other inmates and occasionally even from the guards. Though his knowledge of Christian theology is far from complete, his growing faith and trust in Christ on a day-to-day, -day, even heartbeat-to-heartbeat -heartbeat basis puts me to shame. He openly and regularly testifies to the saving power of Christ before his persecutors. A few have even taken an interest in reading and studying the Bible with him simply because of his testimony and example. Rod has been temporarily transferred 
back to Kendall County, or Cook County, I'm sorry. But he may be released at some point in the fairly near future. Our congregation is making a commitment to help him begin an entirely new life in society as a free man, as a follower of Jesus. My greatest fear in doing this, however, is that Rod, as a young believer, may discover that the faith we, mature Christians, profess gladly and loudly within our church may be only a cheap and flawed imitation of the literally life-sustaining faith that God has nurtured in him, a faith that is even now being refined in the crucible of one of the worst jails in the nation. Rod's story echoes the surprising testimony of some believing American POWs re released from North Vietnam after that war. Their horrifying experiences nurtured in many an unyielding faith and reliance upon our Savior and sharply tuned their spiritual ears to hear the still, small voice of God. Returning to freedom in America, they were shocked to find a sleeping, compromised, atrophied church having dim sight and dulled hearing to the degree that their return to freedom actually challenged their faith even more than the tortures they endured. There are regular reports from the persecuted church around the world that suffering believers pray for persecution for the Western church. Not at all that they wish to celebrate others' pain, but rather that we, with them, would share in the joy of Christ's suffering as Peter writes. The comfort and ease we enjoy as Christians in America may truly be an impediment to a growing, strong, and vital faith. And those days may be coming to an end. The hard truth we must face today is that persecution refines faith. And Malachi is telling us here that a refining is coming. God's refining may even be a necessary prerequisite for his coming. Let me be clear here to prevent any misunderstanding. Malachi is not speaking of a kind of purgatory where we pay for our sins with pain and suffering so that we are righteous enough to enter heaven. Then Christ's sacrifice would not be sufficient. The purifying spoken of here is not to give us quorum Deo, Latin words meaning righteousness before God, the righteousness we must possess to gain eternal life and enter heaven. That righteousness is a gift by faith in Christ alone. That is the gift of justification, the declaration of imputed righteousness to a believing sinner. Justification is a matter of faith alone and therefore is invisible to us and to others. The righteousness spoken of here is rather quorum mundo. Those Latin words mean righteousness before men. This is the lifelong process of sanctification wherein the Holy Spirit conforms our earthly lives to reflect Christ's image to a wicked world. This refining and cleansing that Malachi wrote about works a sanctification which follows after our justification and produces fruit that all men can see. We must keep these two kinds of righteousness absolutely separate in our theological understanding, though they are inseparable in daily Christian life. But as we pray for that day to come, we must acknowledge that whatever cleansing and purging of our churches and our own hearts and lives he ordains, it is, first of all, his good and gracious will, because it will produce an offering in righteousness. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness, Malachi says. The hymn writer said it like this, When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The writer of Hebrews distinctly echoes Malachi's words. Hebrews 12 verses 4 through 11 read, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, then you are illegitimate and not sons. 
Therefore, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We're told that one of the fruits of righteousness is peace. Several Old Testament passages connect righteousness with peace. Isaiah 32, 17 reads, The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. The chastening, refining process will ultimately bring us peace. And that peace is not only the peace of God in the midst of the crucible, it will bring also the peace of victory. It will lead to the end of the struggle with evil around us, because God will fight for us against our enemy. We see that principle at work here in Malachi 2. After this pleasing offering in righteousness is presented in verses 3 and 4, we find God's promise in verse 5 as a response to that pleasant offering. And I will come near you for judgment. Note that this is not a judgment of those who believe. It is a judgment for those who believe. It is judgment of our enemies. Like we read in Psalm 103.6, the Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all who are oppressed. God continues speaking through Malachi in the first person. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. And in verse 11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. In chapter 4, verse 1, And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day is coming, which shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. We might describe it this way. God's jealous love for his beloved is aroused when she is purified and cleansed. He guards her, protects her, and fights for her with all his might. The Lord truly will execute righteousness and judgment for all who are oppressed by evil and wickedness, even when, and especially when, the very same wickedness and evil that oppresses us is used of him to chasten us, refine us, and make us a bride more beautiful and pleasing to him. But despite this alarming message, we need not be discouraged. Perhaps the most important point we need to consider here this morning from the text is that God's love and grace shines in and through all of this. We need not fear his chastening. We need not draw back from whatever troubles and trials evil men devise against God's people. Like Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, shall we not endure with patience and trust the momentary chastening that our loving Father deems eternally beneficial for us? In the midst of what may first appear to be terrifying, we see God's love and grace blaze clearly and brightly in those refining fires. And I want to call your attention to that in four places in our text. First, in verses 2 and 3, He, that is, the one from verse 1 whom we seek and the one in whom we delight, the one we have come to know and trust by faith, the one whose infinite mercy and love for us was proven at the cross, He, is the refiner and launderer who controls everything that happens. Nothing outside of God's perfect will for us can ever happen. The evil one has no say and no power over this process. Amen. Next we see that the motive in the refining our Lord brings to us is good and right. His purpose is not for destruction, not for vengeance, not even for punishment. It is not judgment against the faithful, there is, now for there, no, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. All of God's justice and righteous anger for all of our sin was placed on Jesus at the cross. There is absolutely none left, not an ounce, not a scrap to be meted out to us. His loving plan and purpose for the refining fire is that we, like the heroes of faith of Hebrews 11, 
obtain a better resurrection. It is a process that brings him eternal glory and us eternal blessing. Third, we are reminded that even in the midst of the fiery trials we may face, God's steadfast mercy and grace will not and cannot change or run out. He says in verse 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. These words repeat ideas we find in Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And fourth, his love and grace is evident as we receive his own special attention and care. Verse 16, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. What comfort and hope this verse gives to those who patiently suffer for his name's sake. If and when we find ourselves in the fires of persecution, we have this assurance that God's face is turned towards us. His ear is tuned to hear and respond to our softest cry. He is listening and he will hear. But it gets better. In verse 17, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. The word jewels here literally means special treasure. I can't imagine there could be a richer, deeper word picture of our salvation than this, or a more encouraging message to those in the midst of God's refining crucible. Just as common black carbon under enormous pressure and heat is transformed into crystal clear, brilliant diamonds, so in and through the fires of persecution, he is transforming ordinary, sinful people into jewels for his crown, a special treasure which brings him much delight. There's yet another word picture in this same verse, one that implies the unthinkable. He promises to spare us as a man spares his own son that serves him. Many of us, fathers especially, know the unspeakable joys of having a son. That's multiplied several times over when the son, in willing though imperfect service, truly respects and honors his father. Yet for God to spare us as a man spares his own son who serves him, he was required to do something infinitely greater. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him give us all things? Romans 8.32 God's son was a perfect son who served and honored his father in every way without fail at any point, even at the cost of his own life. Still more than that, 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, the sinless son was made to be sin for us and caused to bear God's just wrath on our sin so that we might be spared and become the righteousness of God. We can comprehend a father's love that spares his son. We grasp the idea that a father's love for his son would be deeper if that son faithfully serves and honors him. But a love so great that it would offer up a perfect son to be made an object of wrath in order to serve, save another, to save even an obstinate, rebellious, disbelieving one, is unfathomable. Yet within this little phrase, we hear God our Father whispering that he loves us even more than his only begotten, sinless Son, not sparing him, even judging him as sin itself, so that we would be spared, sacrificing him to save us. How much he treasures us. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. What does the future hold for Christ's church in 21st century America? I don't know. I'm not a prophet. We cannot know whether continued freedom or whether the wrath of the king. Whether one day history will record of us that they subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, received their dead back to life again. Or instead, 
that people will write that they suffered a trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn in two, were tempted and slain with the sword, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Either way, Malachi would exhort us to fear and trust this loving God with our lives and with our families, even in the midst of trials and pain, even in the midst of mistreatment and persecution, especially in the midst of the refining fire he may ordain for us so that our dross would be purged away and we are made his eternal and undimmable treasure. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that you hold the future. And though we cannot see it, we know that you understand what we need more than anything, that you love us more than we can even grasp. And Lord, we ask that you would build in our hearts more trust, more reliance upon you, that whatever the future holds, we might live for you and become the jewels and the treasure that you desire for us. Lord, your intentions, your plans for us are only good. May we submit ourselves willingly, gladly to them and trust you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.